and welcome to Brain Balance Live. My name's Jen. I am a brain balance parent. And this is Heather. Heather Wells is a wealth of knowledge. She is a board certified cognitive specialist, a therapist. She has been the National Autism Summit speaker. So when it comes to neurodiversity, this chick knows her stuff. Hi, Heather. <laughs> hey there. How are you doing? I am doing good. We are hanging in there with the best of them over here. It is cold here in Florida. You know, well, last, was it last week? Time flies. Um, there was some snow and it's really cold outside, at least for us Southerners. And today it's just bright sunshine. You never know. <laughs> nice. You really don't. And yesterday here in Florida, it was cold, but still a be it was a beautiful day outside yesterday. So I'm trying to enjoy it because they are short lived here, as I'm sure they are in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love the cooler weather. And I yeah. know that we it's um it's February. It's on its way out. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to soak it all up. Uh, mm -hmm. Viewers, if you guys are just tuning in, if you've watched us live before, please, please, please write your comments. Uh, Heather would love to answer your questions. And even if we can't get to them today, they spur ideas for topics later. Um, so make sure that you write those down and we'll try to get those answers to you. Heather, what are we going to be talking to everybody about today? We're, um, the title of today's show is Answers to Your Kids' Reading Struggles. Um, and I wanted to spend time on things that don't get talked about as much. You know, so many times uh, my child has trouble sounding out words. It just looks like it's sounding out words phonics, you know, phonological awareness, um, a lot of things get missed. And so I want to talk about some things that are less intuitive and also what leads to avoidance with reading. If, if you have to kind of, it's like pulling hair, pulling teeth to get kids to read. There's usually a reason why. Uh, a lot of times kids don't want to admit that it's hard for them. Even if they make good grades, they might be having to work too hard at it. And that's no fun. So what are some of those things and what can we do to get their buy-in as well as help them through some of these not obvious struggles? I so, absolutely love this topic because I do think it is possible, especially for really smart kids who have found workarounds to get kind of missed in the system. And then they come out really not being able to read either at all yeah. or very well. We, we have a lot of kids when we do our assessment and um, we will have them answer multiple choice questions. And we have a lot of kids who will make 80%, 100% when they have multiple choice. That is like recognizing the correct answer. Mm -hmm. That is completely different from when we then have them retell the story in their own words and it is not there. Yeah. And so Grades are only part of the story that should never be kind of the major yardstick. I mean, it is one. It has to be one because it's some indicator. It's feedback on how kids are doing, but it does not tell the whole story. And there's also a difference between being able to tell the facts, figures, and details versus reading between the lines and inferring information, understanding the author's purpose. So we have a lot of kids who just sail through school in the first couple of grades. Then they hit third grade or fifth or seventh. Some of these very pivotal moments when expectations go way up. And then it can look like they're just not trying because if they look what they did last year, what they're being asked to do um, is completely next level. And there might be a breakdown there. So, and it's important to catch this early. Bess will pull up the first slide and there has been research done on students. The whole thing, if you've ever been told, don't worry about it, your kids will catch up. Sometimes um, people really believe that sometimes, I mean, we all, I think it's human nature to want to comfort our friends. And, and be reassuring, but sometimes that's ill-advised because then these families show up years later saying, I wish I'd listened to my gut, and now they're more behind. There, there have been studies done, like these two kids in preschool are reading the story of the, um, well, you can see, uh, the bear was mad, she was there. Okay, that's correct, that happened, pretty basic, vocabulary-wise, sentence structure-wise, and then the little girl, Papa Bear, was so frustrated when he came home and found someone had broken into his home. Look at the verbs, the conjugation of the verbs, the complexity of the sentence. Frustrated instead of mad, which has more granularity. It's more pinpoint accurate. They're both correct. And so when they're in pre-K, it could just look like the little girl's language is a little bit ahead. What happens when, by the time they're around age 13? This little boy is 5.2 years behind where this, this girl was because the gaps 
continue to widen, catching it early. Literacy starts before school starts. And for anyone watching, we are going to talk about things at all age levels, including middle and high school, but I, this is where it starts. So we want to be exposing kids to books and print and you know, getting, getting them excited, reading, reading together from the very early ages, have conversations with your kids, building vocabulary, building language also grows literacy because reading is a language and auditory processing based ability. Although other things that are not those two things often get in the way. So um, I just wanted to talk about it. Don't ignore those little things early because those little things become big things later. 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. There are so many skills involved in reading. So first we have to be able to sound out words. Can they decode the words? Do they, those sight words, do they recognize them or they seem brand new every single day? Phonological awareness, knowing what sounds go with what letters, that kind of thing. So we've got the act of reading, which is more what we're learning in pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, and then comprehension reading to learn and that continues to have higher expectations like we just talked about a moment ago but i am going to understand stories better if i bring in my background knowledge background knowledge is often impacted with kids who have neurodevelopmental struggles who have sensory issues etc for example Many of you know that I was born legally blind and had tumors on both optic nerves. So our, my mom was a huge history buff. So most of our uh, vacations growing up entailed going to history museums and things like that. My experience is that we are just walking down hallways, dark hallways, and it's taking a really long time to walk down the hall because I couldn't see the things in the glass cases that other people were looking at. And so if I am reading a story, I cannot bring in any of those experiences. If, if I'm reading a story about a family vacation and they're at the beach, I don't know what color the water was. I don't know what it looks like for the waves to crash in. When I bring in background knowledge, it automatically deepens my enjoyment and my understanding of what I'm reading. Um, vocabulary, that's why I talk, talk, talk to your kids. We're going to talk about fun ways to grow vocabulary. Understanding sentence structures. We have some kids who can understand active sentences like the owner walked his dog. But if it's the dog was walked by his owner, which is called a passive sentence, the action is being performed on the subject of the sentence. Now I don't know what it means. Think about figurative language, being able to reason through language. That's a higher level critical thinking skill. Literacy knowledge, understanding how books are laid out knowing that in some types of books, you know, there's a table of contents, there are glossaries, there are, it, it pays to spend time showing kids how books are laid out. There may be summaries at the end of a chapter, that kind of thing. There may be little highlight things that really kind of pinpoint um, what it's all about that gives them sort of a context for what they're about to read. So comprehension and word recognition, sounding out words come together. They're supposed to become increasingly strategic more and more automated. Y'all hear me talk all the time about are your kids having to work this hard to do something or this hard? If they're having to work this hard, they're not going to enjoy reading. The automatic stuff needs to be automatic so that my brain is freed up to handle the tough stuff as the, as the content gets harder, being able to add my opinions to this, to write an opinion piece based on the facts of what I read. But skilled reading is a combination of those two things, fluent execution and coordination of word recognition and comprehension. That's still not the end of the story. A lot of times that's where we stop with it. We, when we think of reading, we just think of reading skills, like at, in the traditional sense. We also have to have working memory. I have to remember what the previous sentence or the previous paragraph said and how it connects to what I'm reading right now. A lot of our kids struggle with working memory. In fact, uh, uh, many experts say that ADHD is really starts with a working memory deficit and um, others frame it as a regulation deficit, but working memory is huge in those with ADHD. We have, we have a smaller mental sketch pad of where we can hold in pieces of information. If we are working too hard at any part of this process that is shrinking down, that's using up part of my mental sketch pad. Um, we have to have cognitive flexibility. 
Some words have multiple meanings. So th think about the word bat. Are we talking about the thing you find in caves that flies or are we talking about a baseball bat? Some kids will get hung up on the definition they know and they're so confused the sentence doesn't make sense. Envelope, envelop, two dip, spelled exactly the same, which you know which um, syllable to emphasize based on the context. Your kids have difficulty seeing the big picture and using context clues. Um, a lot of kids can tell you all the baseball stats in the story, but they didn't know it was about sportsmanship. You got to have big picture and details. Um, you've got to have regulation to know when you need to slow down. Wait, I missed that and not just keep motoring through. I need to go back and reread that, that kind of thing. There's so much more to this and, and that struggles with any of these skills. You can have kids who are strong in 90% of these skills. If any of these is not automated for them, it is going to take out of other buckets and it can make them detest reading. Okay, so let's move on. So a lot of parts of our sensory system can get in the way of reading. I mean, if I have difficulty, if, if you have kids with tactile sensitivities um, or certain types of touch bother them, I may not understand adjectives, rough, smooth, hard, soft, silky. Those, so reading feels very bland to me because I don't know what those descriptive words mean. But ones that so hugely impact reading the most, the one that we hear about all the time, auditory processing, we have seven auditory pathways that communicate different parts of the acoustic signal. Sometimes kids will, let's say a child has dyslexia, that is a language and auditory processing based challenge. They are, as they're reading words, different sounds are arriving in their auditory processing center in the wrong order. So that, so they see desk as the word dex. And now they're thinking of the thing on the back of the house. Okay. Um, uh, so, or if you have kids who have a hard time hearing the difference between bad and bed, B-A-D, B-E-D, that really, that, that's the type of struggles you will see with auditory processing. Sometimes it looks like kids are having difficulty sounding out words, which automatically makes schools think auditory processing. It's definitely something to rule in or out. And it might be visual perception and processing. This was me. Once my eyesight was fixed or my eyes could see, my brain did not know how to interpret visual information. So as I would read, you can see in the top left of this book on, on the right side of the page, I, I, I keep using my cursor and I don't have control, <laughs> control of the screen. But look, the cat, the cat ran out. You can see in the top left where those red dots are. That shows eyes skipping around. We have a lot of kids whose eye tracking is off. And so the reason it looks like they're having difficulty sounding out words is because their eyes are skipping around. They're skipping over certain letters, words, phrases, or seeing them out of order. If your kids write letters backwards, that does not mean dyslexia. That is not a hallmark sign of dyslexia. It can go with dyslexia. But if a child with visual sees the word desk and spells it dex, it's because they saw the words in reverse order. Both can impact spelling. Both can impact the fluency of the reading. Some kids will have difficulty discerning the differences in certain letters. If you look at N, H, and R, how often do you think about those being similar? They're, they're vastly different when our eyes interpret, when our brain interprets what our eyes see correctly. But the R, the hump just doesn't come all the way to the, to the base like the N does. With an H, it just has a stick on the left that the N doesn't have. Those are not obvious differences to a lot of our kids. So look at how they form the letters and they are pro they're writing them the way they're singing them. And um, we, 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 we have people come in all the time where it looks nonsensical if you don't pay attention to what's happening about how on earth do they think this, the word um, Nancy starts with an H. They don't know the difference. Yeah. So um, look at how, how, look at how the text, the lines themselves can overlap or the letters can become fuzzy. A lot of people would think that this is eyesight. That means, oh, they don't have 20-20 eyesight because they're seeing double. That means the eyes aren't teaming together. You can still have 20-20 eyesight and words overlap when your eyes are not teaming together. The eyes don't team together often when the left and right hemisphere are not working as a team. If you have kids who say the letters are jumping or dancing around on the page, that sounds silly. I've had a lot of 
parents say, I didn't believe my kids when they told me that. Now I feel bad about it. I mean, it sounds ridiculous if, if you don't, if you've never experienced it. My sure. letters always had a dance party. I was wondering why no one else ever mentioned it. <laughs> if your kids beyond the really young ages of pre-K, you know, kindergarten, first grade, if they need to use a finger, that their eyes, they're having trouble with eye tracking very likely. Um, or if you notice them just rubbing their head or holding their head as they're reading or writing, if they're leaning over, those are sign, very strong signs and um, that there could be a visual perception issue going on. And it's visual perception issues are based on issues even underlying that. So it's not enough to just take care of visual. P people ask me that all the time. I just wanted you to know that visual perception gets missed a lot and it can have some of the exact same overt signs as issues with auditory processing. You must know which one it is, or is it a combination of both or else these kids will continue to struggle. And I will say one other thing before we move on, almost 25% of our brain's function goes to visual perception and processing. So when this is not working like a well-oiled machine, it is one of the most mentally and emotionally taxing struggles a child can have. If you have kids who look like they're making careless errors, if they are avoiding reading, if they behave better at school and then it's worse at home, they have been using their visual perception all day long and I'm up to here, bleh, or task avoidance, pulling back. It impacts reading, writing, spelling. This gets missed all the time. Okay, let's move on. It requires self-regulation to use fix-up strategies when you don't know what a word is, you're having trouble sounding it out, or you're not understanding the passage. So if you have kids who are impulsive, if you have kids with emotional dysregulation, it can also come out um, in blowing through stuff when they didn't understand, okay? So um, it is important to, oh, and sometimes kids would be willing to do it, but they don't know what the strategies are. Because some of us just organically use these strategies and they don't think to do it. So um, slow down, reread using context clues. If your kids have trouble with the big picture, how do I use the context? We, we need to let them know that sometimes if there's an unfamiliar word, um, a lot of times the author will put the definition somewhere in there or, or a, an antonym, an opposite meaning word is there for contrast. Um, but if your kids, like their eye tracking is off, all the brain juice is going to what I miss, what I miss, what I miss. And they, they don't even have the brain power left to think about what they're reading. So is it that they really can't understand or they don't have any brain juice left? That's another thing. Um, look up words you don't know. Whew, who knew? And it's really a good idea when you think about study space. We want it to be uncluttered, but we need the necessary items there. A thesaurus or a dictionary are very good here. I do recommend having an actual book with a binder, a binding, not, you can use online dictionaries, of course, but then sometimes kids are really tempted to get off track and do other things. I know y'all don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask questions. What? I mean, think you can get into a habit of saying, ask questions at the end of each paragraph. Did I understand what I read? If you don't, asking for guidance from parents or a study buddy, if we're talking about kids in middle school, what did that chapter mean to you or this particular passage? What did you get out of it? And even talking about that deepens the knowledge because you're hearing different perspectives on it and talking about it out loud. A lot of kids have stronger oral language than written language abilities and by, or having them share with you what they learned today when you're sitting at the dinner table, that can really, that's like mental Velcro that starts making the concept stick. And um, combine new information with background knowledge. That, that goes back to what we said. If you have kids with neurodevelopmental struggles or sensory issues, et cetera, they may have been exposed to information, but not really have it as background knowledge because they did not experience it the way other people did. But help them make those connections. What does this remind you of? Um, and bring in a hobby they have or a vacation or anything in, in life, something they did at church with a friend that connects to that because now they automatically are going to understand better. So teach them to think about how it relates to what is something I already know about this? What am I curious about? Get, get metacognitive questions going where kids are thinking about their thinking. It's one of the most important life skills. Think about the author's purpose. What is the author trying to tell me? Why did he write this? Is he informing me of facts? Is he sharing his opinion? Is it for entertainment? If it's for entertainment, that may help kids 
pick up on jokes and sarcasm and figures of speech instead of taking it literally. Um, pay attention to your thoughts. Teach kids. Remember when we did um, Do My Kids Choose When to Pay Attention? I said there was a college student that just by learning to pay attention to what she was paying attention to, that became all she needed. And she'd realized what was distracting her in her class at school. But the same thing, teach kids to think, am I really honed in on here? What am I thinking about? Sometimes they are paying attention, but what they're reading made them think about something and that helps them connect dots to something they already know. Um, combine what you've already read with the current text. So the previous paragraph, the previous chapter, the previous sentence, depending on the level, kids don't necessarily know to pause and do that. And this, I'm, the reason these things are listed, they may seem obvious to us, but if kids are struggling, some of these aren't obvious to them and teach kids to look for chunks of words they know. And then they don't feel like this whole long word. I don't know how to sound it out. If I am blowing over words and I don't know what they are, I'm, it's going to decrease comprehension. Fluency impacts comprehension about mid second grade. Third grade is when we're supposed to go from learning to read to reading to learn. But fluency of reading continues to grow all the way through middle school. Um, but just, Kids have to know what they're thinking. They have to know whether they understand it or not. That requires a lot of self-awareness. So if your kids are impulsive, play games to help them with impulsivity, because that's also helping reading as well as behavioral, emotional things as well. But playing Simon Says, they have to pause and wait to think about if Simon said X, Y, Z before they do it. Um, red light, green light. Play, play different games with cars where you're going fast, fast, fast and then a medium speed, a slow speed. And then when they're reading and say, are you being a green car, a yellow car, or a, or a red car? Something that gives that a concrete depiction helps them understand the concept of the right pacing to go. But it's just not obvious that self-regulation gets in the way of reading often, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and a lot of times these kids will make good grades. And so but it doesn't mean it's easy and they're having to work too hard and they have to do extra effort to go back to find the answer. Whereas if they'd been more methodical in the first place, they wouldn't hate reading so much because they got it the first time. Yeah. So this applies to any level. Those who are good readers can become better. Those who are really struggling, these are huge answers. And those who just because kids are smart doesn't mean there's not a reading struggle. Some of the smartest people I know have some reading challenges. Okay, let's move on. One of the biggest things we can do to cultivate a love of reading as well as reading success is to pre-read. This is, this is one of my favorite tips of all time in my 30 year career. And it is a game changer. Before you even open a book, have kids guess what the story is about based upon the book cover. And before you do that, I recommend practicing with pictures that have nothing to do with the book. Kids often, if you have kids who sort of have perfectionistic tendencies or they opt out, if they are not participating in class, if they have low self-esteem, sometimes kids will not put themselves out there and answer questions because what if I'm wrong? They think I am what I do. So if I give a wrong answer, then I'm dumb. And now I don't even want to try. Now I'm more self-conscious. But have kids look at pictures. Here's an example in the left. What, what, what's happening in the picture? And they might say something like, uh, a little boy is walking his, his dog in the rain. And, and, and there's no right or wrong answers. This, what's beautiful about this is they're guessing. Let's make guesses about what's in the picture. There is no right or wrong with a guess. So now a lot of those things that hold them back aren't in the way. Do we know it's his dog? We don't tell them they're wrong. <laughs> we don't scold them. Do we know it's his dog? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, how do we know? And, and hopefully they're going to say, well, you know what? We don't know. Well, who else's dog could it be? Well, he could be walking the neighbor's dog. That's right. And, and you kind of go through things like that. And do we know it's raining? Well, yeah, because there's water. What else could make the sidewalk be covered with water? And you can go through things like that. It could be a burst pipe. It could be that somebody's washing their, you know, their, six cars in the driveway and it's all kind of gathered there. But what we're doing is we're getting their minds curious, helping them understand that things are not always as they appear 
and that we are we inferred that it's his dog. We, now we're teaching what an inference is, it is. And as we read, we find out which one of our guesses is right and which ones weren't. And there's no right or wrong in our guesses, but now we're looking for the facts. And so that helps them understand a fact versus an inference. A lot of kids, especially very black and white thinkers, don't understand inferences. It is this way or it is this way. Is it really? You are growing cognitive flexibility. You are growing their ability to look at things from different vantage points. This is huge for social emotional growth as well as academic growth. Okay. Um, relate it to other contexts. This in pictures and books, what does this make you think of? They are starting to understand how they can glean information from something else and apply it to their own lives. And if they hate reading, we're not even doing reading yet. We're looking at pictures. You can do the same thing with movies. What are you curious about with this movie? What do you think is going to happen? Why do you think it's called this? Practice these skills and then they carry over to literacy. Um, and then do the same thing with books. Now they understand the concept of guessing and there's no right or wrong. And wow, that's kind of fun. And now I'm curious about it. They can make up a story about the picture. But now, why do you think this book is called Stan the Hot Dog Man? You know, and it can be because he likes to eat hot dogs, because he sells hot dogs. Well, who do you think's on the cover? Depending on level, I think it's Stan. We still don't even know it's Stan, although yes, it is. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Ask them what they think the book is about. And where do you think it, where do you think it takes place? Just ask lots of questions. You're garnering curiosity. Curiosity lights up the brain. We all need curiosity for those who have ADHD or ADHD ish types of things. I said last week that that is a need for most like food and water that gets attention going. I am general. What do you want to know? What answers do you want? What, what uh, questions do you want answered when you read this book? And they can spout off questions. You come up with questions you're curious about. And now they are going to pay better attention in the book because they generated questions and they are looking for the answers to their questions. I came up with the questions, so it is super interesting to me. Yeah. And later on, the recall of the story goes through the roof. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so this is just huge. But before you read, look for unfamiliar language. Talk about what that vocabulary means. Maybe it is um, figurative language. It's raining cats and dogs. What do you think that means? Talk about all these things in advance. And the reason this is beneficial is because so many kids blow through when they don't know a vocabulary word. And now they understand the story less. So now I don't feel successful at it. So now I avoid reading. When we come across these words, we've already talked about what they mean. We've already generated these questions. You've already got me thinking, what is this story about? Now I have a context for everything to come. And then when you're done, go back to what your guesses were and say, was that, was that true or false? Was that right or, or, or that, that wasn't accurate? And go through and then they cite how they know that their guess was or was not accurate. It's not wrong because it was a guess but it turns out it didn't mesh with the story. And so now we're not telling them that they can just guess what a story is about and it's fine. That we're te you, I cannot explain how powerful this is. One of the best things you can do to get kids engaged in stories. And when they read, when you read it together, they understand it and hey, reading's not so bad. And when you do get to that novel language that you reviewed beforehand, still pause during. And what did that word mean again? And if they forget, teach them to use the context to figure it out. OK, but um, this makes an enormous, enormous, enormous difference. All right. I absolutely Let's, love this trick. I'm definitely using that. <laughs> it is. And it is completely evidence based. I mean, reading outcomes go through the roof by pre-reading. Amazing. And I know I said this at the beginning. It bears repeating so many times when kids avoid reading or call it boring. It is not just because they'd rather do something else. Why had they rather do something else? It so many times kids do not want you to know they're struggling. I don't feel really confident in myself in a lot of ways, but my parents think I'm smart and I don't want to lose that. That's what I have going for me. So if I call it boring, it's just because I don't want to do it. Not because I can't or not because it's too hard. And I mean, even for kids who make straight A's, it is not just about the grade. How hard are they working at it? So, um, help kids find books and even better book series that have relatable characters. 
on my page, I routinely put up book lists that have leading characters who have dyslexia, ADHD, emotional anger struggles. And there are ones about space invasion, things that are relatable that bring humor. And, and it's like, hey, this character is my friend. I relate to them. And they want to read more. And when you read book series, they already know the characters. They want to know what's happening in their lives next. And it builds and builds and builds because they have some context for the story before they start. And they're just, they really can, it can really feel like the characters are friends or books about their interests. Now, I want to give you a caveat to this. We need times where kids just read for fun. When they feel successful, let them read books that are at or even below their age level when they're reading by themselves. But if you are trying to grow certain skills, understand that if every single book is about ball a ballet dancer and they are ballet dancers, they are not stretching their minds and growing as much. So it's good. Maybe it has an element of something they're interested in, but it also relates to other things. But there are times to just let them read that book that they love that is right in their wheelhouse, if you, especially if they are really avoidant of reading. I just wanted to be clear that that does decrease the amount of growth that happens if all they ever read are things they're extremely familiar with. But I would argue that in school, they're sort of being forced to read things <laughs> that would not be of their choosing. But I just keep that in mind. Depends on your needs. But I'm trying to give you both sides of the coin. But I'm huge on allowing them to read things that are their interest. Or, or I love, love, love books with characters, leading characters who have struggles similar to theirs because they realize I'm not all alone. Yeah. Wow, I get this. Yeah. I have book lists all the time on, on my page. Um, <clears throat> 15 minutes a day of fun reading needs to be the minimum. If you do less than that, we're, we're hurting our kids. 15 minutes a day of reading. I highly recommend parents also read in front of their kids for 15 minutes a day that, and not on a screen, not Facebook, not Instagram, mm -hmm. not an article, a book. Because it needs to be just an entire environment that shows the value of reading. Talk about the benefits of reading in terms that benefit them. They want to become a, um, a doctor. I'm just making this up. How do you think reading and helping reading get easier and easier, more natural for you is going to help you with that? Whatever their goals are, talk about it in terms that benefit them. Um, make the book search fun. Go to the library. If you, Amazon, of course, is a great source for books. But... Make it an event. Maybe you're getting popcorn as you're doing it so that the whole thing, they are attaching positive memories to this whole literacy thing, you know. Um, but the reason I have journaling or making scrapbooks here is because the automaticity of handwriting, how, how automated is handwriting, that directly also is predictive of reading abilities. These things are very intertwined. So getting their thoughts onto paper, uh, stream of consciousness, you can give them journal prompts. Um, or when you've gone through vocabulary, you can have them, you know, write anything in your journal you want, but use this, th these words that we practiced. And understand that if kids are having language struggles, research shows that they need a good three times more exposure to new words to make them stick. Oh, and wow. That's, a, that's an excellent way to do it. Yeah. Um, did you know that kids benefit from parents reading aloud to them all the way through at least middle school. I, I don't know that that happens on a regular basis. A lot of times we do when they're little mm -hmm. and, and then we stop. Yeah. But understand that when we're reading aloud to kids, they are hearing what it's supposed to sound like. They are hearing your prosody, your intonation, your stress patterns, where you pause. They are hearing how to pronounce words and that directly impacts how they know how things are supposed to sound and their reading fluency. Reading the same book over and over does improve their reading fluency also. So I want to share that. Sometimes you, you might think, how could that be? No, they are still learning what the, what the comma means, what the period means, how the inflection and how those stress patterns impact the meaning, et cetera. So, and it's a good idea to read when you're reading with reading with or to your kids, you can select books unless they have severe. It, everything is individual specific, but in general, a lot of kids can benefit from you reading books with or to them that are a couple of levels ahead of what they could read on their own. OK, because you're reading to them, they don't have to be able to 
sound out all those words, you're taking some of that cognitive load off them. Yeah. They are getting to use higher level thinking. They, they are getting exposed to greater vocabulary that will then just sort of propel them forward. We and, actually did this this year with um, Parker and I was kind of a, I was a little a bit of a naysayer about it. His godparents got him those diary of a wimpy kid books and he's only yes. six. And I was like, oh, this is way above level. <laughs> so I just started reading it to him and he was like, I want to try. And he'll, he does exactly what you're talking about, but it kind of happened by accident. So I'm <laughs> glad to hear that was a happy accident. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, understand that if they're reading by themselves at, or maybe even a little bit below age level, just so that they don't always associate a struggle with reading, yeah. reading with them at or above. And we can unintentionally convey that reading is boring or it's a chore when we use it as a punishment. Mm. They get in trouble. Go to your room and read. Yeah. <laughs> reading is a punishment or rewarding it. Yay. You read it. So now you get this. Let them see that reading is the reward in itself. Help yeah. that. That's where find, helping them see the benefit in it so that the act of reading is the, is intrinsically motivated, not because of the carrot we're dangling in front of them. Labeling kids. If we talk about, I know you're a slow reader, or if they hear you talking about them as a reluctant reader, that automatically is going to shade the way they view reading. So these are all unintentional ways that we can convey that it's boring, or if they never see us reading a book, not the screen. Got it. Okay, let's move on. Okay, one thing I'm going to tell you is that teaching parts of words is, is another of the most powerful things you can do to grow reading comprehension, as well as language skills, of course, and writing skills. So what I mean by that, it's called morphology. Words that have a root word and a prefix, suffix, they may have one or the other or both. So when kids know re means to do again, when they know what ing, it's the present progressive, like it's happening right now on verbs, meant, T-I-O-N, when you, uh, you in the opposite of, when they learn what those root words and suffixes mean, you are growing their vocabulary by multi thousands. The average fifth grader is exposed to over 10,000 new words. The average fifth grader learns eight to two, 10 new words a week. There is a humongous disconnect and one of the most powerful ways to bridge that gap is to teach root words, prefixes, suffixes. You can have word walls. And let's say you just have a, a word in the middle of it, like done, D-O-N-E. How many different ways throughout the week go in? Undone, redone, that kind of thing. Develop, redevelopment, redeveloping, you know, under development. Now the whole word's not unfamiliar. I can notice the, the prefix of suffix is root words. And I know what all those mean. So now my vocabulary just exploded. And it these is, are also helpful for adults if they're playing Wordle a lot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Which is what playing games, how many word games are there? Do crossword puzzles, Wordle, Scrabble. I, had, I just have lots of a, pictures of ideas, but y'all know there are so many hands-on games where they are manipulating the pieces and putting things together. You know, you can have blocks that have letters on, depending on the age, play games that cultivate literacy and language word ladders, which is what's on the left. If you Google word ladders, a bunch of matches are going to come up and it's like where you start with a word, it gives you a hint on a word and then it will say, now change the first word to where it means the da 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 da. Ah, so these are super fun and they grow the ability to sound out words and reading comprehension enormously, extremely, extremely evidence-based word ladders, Google it. And your kids can also create their own that they give you to solve. And they are growing so many skills in doing that. But also if you get books that have word families, Dr. Seuss comes to mind for the littles. But if you look at all of these, I have like dash a B, a C K all, all of these, if you add an initial letter to all these words, all the different combinations that are possible right there, kids are able to read and spell 654 one syllable words by practicing these. These are excellent for a word wall. Pay, say, day, nay, etc. Um, 
but make make it games. Have a ha, having a whiteboard. There's just some anything that makes it different from what you're doing at the desk for homework. It's a it's a whiteboard or find the word in our family quote of the week that has the word we're practicing this week, you know, and then do things yeah. with it. Okay. Let's move on. That's it. That was so good, Heather. I, she was telling me before, you know, we talk a lot about kind of the emotion of, of how all these things affect us, but this is uh, academically and emotional that you've kind of connected here. So thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, reading affects every part of life. I mean, it affects every school subject. Um, we have to have it to, to get through life and, and yeah. helping kids understand why it matters. I mean, of all the subjects, they can say, this is so dumb. When are we ever going to use it? I mean, we can talk them through any subject on that, but we can't say that of reading. Literacy yeah. is, it's, you must have it to, yes. to get through life really. Yes. And so helping them understand how important it is and seeing the value of it. I, there are many I mean, if we're going to do a whole reading thing, it would take three days. But I was trying to talk about some things that are less intuitive, I think. Yeah, no, I think you really, really gave a lot of great tools. If you guys enjoyed this, if you want more, write those comments down. Contact your local brain balance centers, as you can see there. And as always, Heather is at Hidden Churn and at The Hidden Churn. No, just at The Hidden Churn. I always say it wrong. Uh, no, on Instagram, it's at The Hidden Churn. And I don't know why I, it's... The, I did it as the hidden turn on Facebook, but the, but the way to get there is facebook.com forward slash hidden turn. They took the out of it. That, that's so, just how it worked. You will find it though in the search bar, no matter where you go or just type Heather Wells and call your local uh, brain balance center, get that um, assessment today. Anything else going on for you this week, Heather? Dr. Brian and I will be back Thursday at one o'clock. Beautiful. All right. Well, we will see you guys next week. Same time, same place. Great to chat with you, Heather. You too.